Hi. Hi. Oh, you guys are so friendly. <laughs> I love Portland. We um, do. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So let's let's allow that, and whoop, let's go back. All right. So, thanks for being here. Um, apologies up front. Uh, my name is Paul Baker. I'm on the Slack channel as at paulbaker3. I was the dude that volunteered to send out the reminder email that didn't go out until, yay, that didn't go out until this morning. Apologies for that. Next month I will be much more prepared because I'll know what the hell I'm doing and I won't get caught in the spam filter that I got caught in this morning. So. It totally wasn't his fault he didn't know until yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm going to be talking to you about uh, a really, uh, this, is, this is kind of an obnoxious title. I'm just going to go with that. Um, but I'm calling this Golden Thorns, Lessons, from the Golden Master Lessons in Golden Master Testing from the Gilded Rose Kata. Um, it actually has nothing to do with the Gilded Rose Kata, but everybody knows, well, some people know the Gilded Rose Kata, and uh, that's cool. So, but really this is all about Golden Master Testing, and I'll get into that in a little bit. But uh, first, uh, WTFMI. Um, again, my name is Paul Baker. You can find me pretty much anywhere on the interwebs as Paul Baker 3. Um, so I'm a husband and father, a nerd. I like sci fi stuff, um, gaming, and all that kind of stuff. If you're on Steam, I'm on that and addict it. Um, I've been hacking on st stuff since 1999, which is when I first got my first computer. Um, it's kind of late to the game as nerd nerds go. And then I started deving for money uh, a couple years later, and I started doing Ruby about three years ago, and I love it. I'm currently at a company called CapShare, and we help companies make smart decisions with their equity. Uh, we help you issue shares and manage your stockholders, or your shareholders. Um, so if you're ever interested in that kind of stuff, please feel free to give me a, a call or hit me up on Twitter. Um, and this talk is really about legacy code and how it sucks, why it sucks, and some of the techniques that I've been thinking about recently. This is definitely not an authoritative uh, talk. Um, these are really just kind of musings that I've had over the last month or so. Um, so who here has actually worked with some legacy code in their career? Show of hands. Yeah, awesome. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, legacy code sucks, and for a while, I thought that maybe I was doing it wrong, uh, that legacy code shouldn't be so, pa so painful, but I've actually found out that that's actually not the case. Legacy code is going to be painful, and it's really a matter of how you approach it that will determine whether or not you're going to be successful with it. At least that's my opinion at this point. Um, there's a definition, I think it's by Michael Feathers, uh, that says that legacy code is any code without unit tests. There's another definition that's been floating around, possibly also by Michael Feathers, which is legacy code is any code that you are afraid to change and provides value. So the idea there being that this code does stuff, that stuff generates revenue, that revenue pays your paycheck, your company really doesn't want you to break that stuff, but it, at some point somebody asks you to change that stuff, and that's scary, right? So that's basically legacy code in a nutshell. Um, one of the things here is that uh, usually legacy code is either untested or what I'm calling naively tested. And by, by naively tested, I mean that the code, the test might be there, but the tests don't actually tell you anything of note. And when the tests fail, you usually just have more WTFs than if the test, the test didn't exist at all. Right? Has anybody actually run into this situation, or am I the only person? Okay, a couple of hands going up, so I don't feel like a total idiot. Um, oh yeah, gifts work, thank you. Um, so, legacy code. If you are not afraid, uh, like Brent yeah. said earlier, you're doing it wrong. Uh, legacy code is something that, that we all have to basically approach with some reverence because it is doing the thing that pays our paycheck. And yet, we have to change it sometimes. So how do you go about changing that code? 
Um, now, some people will jump to the conclusion that we just basically blow it away and rewrite it, right? Or just go in there and start changing things. You can only get better. Um, that is usually not the right instinct. If your instinct is to rewrite or to just make changes without tests, you're definitely doing it wrong. Um, so then the answer must be to have tests around it, and then we can go from there. The only problem is that not all tests are useful tests. And this goes back to what I was saying earlier about naively tested code. Um, in, a, in a project that I worked on a couple years ago, we, I inherited a code base that had zero unit tests. And it was awesome. It was like 10,000 lines of code, absolutely no unit testing whatsoever. And it was regressing all over the place. Anytime you touched anything, it would just blow up spectacularly. Um, and it was in production, which was super cool. And we were trying to make money with it, which was also super awesome. So we hired a senior developer. And he came in and said, I have the answer. I'm going to get 100% uh, test coverage with unit tests. And then he spent about the next eight weeks just writing unit tests. That's all he did. And we paid a senior developer's rate for the next eight weeks for him to write unit tests. And at the end of those eight weeks, we had 100% test coverage. And we were like, yay, we can start refactoring, right? No. <laughs> as soon as we started refactoring, all the tests would break in, the we in these weird, unpredictable, or it wouldn't break in an unpredictable, or would break massively across the spectrum ways, right? So we would have t changes where nothing would happen. We'd have changes where everything would break. And we would have somewhere in between where regression would get through for you know, edge cases. And we were like, why the heck did we spend eight weeks of resources on this project? Um, and this is where I learned that not all tests are useful tests. And adding useful unit tests can be hard, expensive, and occasionally, from what I hear, theoretically impossible. I'm not necessarily, necessarily sure that that is true. Um, it is true if you're not willing to take certain risks. Um, but the definition of impossible might be different for certain people. So that's kind of an opinion piece on, from my, on my part. Um, so take that with a grain of salt. But either way, uh, writing useful unit tests is not trivial especially when you're working with really nasty code. If your code didn't come tested, it probably is going to be, it's going to have some form of nasty in it. Um, so adding unit tests to it is going to be difficult. I was actually having lunch today um, with some of the Rubyists out in Beaverton, which is where I live, and we were talking about this a little bit. And one of the things that I, I had said was that in the last year or so in working with legacy code and trying to get it under unit test, one of the things that I've realized is that if, you're, if your code is really hard to get under unit test, that is a clear smell that your code sucks. If your code can't be tested, your code's not right. So here's the problem, though. If you can't test your code, how do you change your code to make it testable? right? Because you should never be changing code without a test. So you're in this like terrible catch-22. So here's where I would say require test meow, okay? And for me, test meow used to mean integration tests using Capybara, right? This was the first thing that I, I did that kind of got me out of that quagmire where we had written a whole bunch of useless unit tests. We wrote a huge Capybara test suite that kind of wrapped the whole piece of the whole repo up, and then we were able to start refactoring it. And if the Capybara tests broke, then we knew that we had screwed something up pretty badly. But does anybody see a problem with this? Has anybody done something like this where you write integration tests to provide some level of comfort before refactoring? A couple of hands? Yeah. Does anybody know what happens with this test meow over time? Yeah, it completely falls apart. Thank you for your participation. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm a little nervous, by the way. This is my second PDXRB meeting. Um, yay! Yeah, we just moved here in July, and I uh, kind of fell off the radar. So I'm back. Yay! Um, but like I said, I'm a little nervous. So for, your, for, uh, for participating, I really appreciate that. But like you said, um, whatever your test meow happens to be, whether it be 
um, naive unit tests, integration tests, functional tests, capybara tests, um, manual dudes in some developing nation clicking through stuff. I'm getting a little laugh over here. That sounds like someone who knows. <laughs> um, this will fall apart. Whatever your test meow is, that will fall apart. And the reason for it is that your particular flavor of test meow is based on the current state of your code. And that state will change over time, and those changes are not going to be encapsulated in your test meow, or they're going to be really difficult to update, right? Which is why to go back, oh, actually, let's go forward. Um, the gold standard of testing are unit tests that are written by developers at the point of change, right? So your problem's not solved with test meow. It's really only going to get worse. And this is what I'm talking about when I say from therapy to injury. You kind of put a cast around your code with, with whatever your particular flavor of test meow is. And then that cast, while it is useful at the moment that you put it on and will allow you to make some changes, over time as your code starts to evolve and your use cases start to change, that test meow, that cast, will, will cause problems, will cause injury. And there's a really good blog post here. Um, I'll share out the slide so you don't have to take any notes or anything like that. But there was a really good blog post on this uh, Code Whisperer blog talking about how integration tests are a scam. And he also talks a little bit about uh, this particular concept of using Golden Master um, as a strategy for getting out of this quagmire that we're in with legacy code. Excuse me. So while other testing strategies and tools do provide value, your integration tests, your capybara test, your functional test, all these other uh, manual testing, they do provide value. They are not meant to replace the feedback that you get with those dots when you run R spec or R test, right? Those dots are really, really important for your development to be able to develop effectively. Um, but getting those dots can be really costly. So how do we get around that problem? Um, and again, once you've done this, if you've done your test meow, you'll be like, man, we are freaking awesome. We're totally covered, right? We can absolutely change our code. And then one day you'll have this moment where you go, why? So don't worry, I have a solution for you. And to make it even better, it's an anti-pattern. <laughs> So this anti-pattern is known as the golden master or guru checks the output testing strategy. Um, but it's okay, just go with it. Um, we're gonna have a couple of assumptions. So one is that your code functions as it's designed, right? Bugs, warts, nastiness, all that stuff, we're just gonna accept it, right? Just be really accepting, super Portland-like, like, I love you because you're you kind of thing. Um, and, just, whoop, and just accept that your code does what, it's, what it actually is doing in production. So we don't want to change anything. But seriously, we really want to change everything. And what I mean by that is you need to refactor your code so that your code is unit testable in a, an effective way. Right? So you can't change the output of your code because that would be introducing a, a regression or an unknown regression. You might have existing bugs and you might find them in your tests, but that's okay. Just, just accept the bugs, right? But you need to be able to get in there and start breaking apart your dependencies, extracting things that need to be extracted, and simplifying your methods and classes so that you can actually put a, a useful unit test around them. And really, it's not that crazy, I promise. There are other people besides me that have talked about this. Um, so this guy, J.B. Rainsberger, who is the code whisperer, actually has a blog post specifically on this, talking about using Golden Master and sampling in order to effectively survive your legacy code. And don't worry, there is a gem for it as well. And we'll actually be using the approvals gem uh, written by Katrina. Owens, thank you, um, that I was turned on to by Randy Coleman at last year's RailsConf. 
so first, a little bit of background about the code. We're going to be looking at what's known as the Gilded Rose Kata. Um, has anybody heard of this code? Cool, like three other people. Awesome. <laughs> So I'm already providing value. You guys are going to learn something, which is the fact that the Gilded Rose Kata exists. <laughs> so the Gilded Rose Kata is a legacy coding exercise. It was first created by a guy named Bobby Johnson in 2011, and I believe it was done in C Sharp. Um, it was ported to Ruby by the late Jim Wyrick, and then it's been commented on by Sandy Metz and uh, my friend Randy Coleman. Um, Sandy Metz did a really cool talk called All the Little Things that you should watch. Um, she did it at RailsConf 2014, and then she also did it at Ruby on Ales the same year. And it's really freaking awesome. You should definitely take a, a moment to watch it. Randy Coleman did the talk on this kata in, on, at RailsConf 2015, but he also did a modified version of it before RailsConf, both of which are really worth uh, watching on ConFreaks if you get a chance. Um, so the code itself, is just uh, a very small contrived example of what legacy code might look like. And the problem that you're presented with is implementing a feature and doing so without re introducing any regressions. So let's go to the editor. And I'm just going to let you guys know right up front uh, that I have a cheat sheet over here. Don't judge me. I'm, like I said, I'm a little nervous. Um, so I'm going to have that up just in case I get stumped or I forget something. Uh, can you embiggen the font? Embiggen the font? I, I can embiggen stuff, I think. Yeah. Super awesome. All right, let's not do the split screeny thing. Eh, maybe we'll do the split screeny thing. All right. Is that embiggen enough? No? A little bigger? Is that good? Maybe? All right, there we go. Now everybody can see, maybe. All right, and let's do the embiggening here. Oh, no. <laughs> I think I lost the bottom of my thing. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Yay. Like I said, this is actually my first presentation in front of like a real audience. I shouldn't say that. I presented this talk in a modified version, an early version, at uh, Test RV last month. But there were like six people and we sat around a table just chatting. So this is definitely a different experience. Um, all right, so here is the Gilded Rose Kata. I'll show you the directory structure right here. Nothing to look at, really. Um, You've got the Gilded Rose, and it has two files in it, the Gilded Rose class and then the item class. And I want to get rid of that. Um, so the item, an item basically just has three attributes, name, sell-in, and quantity. We don't really know what any of this stuff is. Um, we have a spec that does basically nothing but hey, at least we have a spec. <laughs> um, the spec will run. Look at that. So like our code is totally, it's super fast and it totally passes. So let's just hack this thing in, right? Um, I'm not even gonna talk about what you're actually supposed to add to Gilded Rose because that's not the point of this talk. The problem here is that if I do something like this, Dude, I can totally ship it at this point, right? I don't even know. I actually haven't even tried this, so let's see what happens if I do this. I just want to. I just want to see, like, how bad can I mutate this code without it blowing up? Oh, okay. I blew something up. Yeah. Oh, is it indent? Did I? Oh, I have an else. Yeah. Will it? Let me try. Let's just comment all this out. As long as that method exists, your spec will pass. I haven't even. Yeah, it will. 
<laughs> Let's just do it. Oh, sweet. <laughs> No, we definitely got a performance improvement. Yeah, so... What was that? Like, yeah, we got like, like 16 millionths of a second or whatever. So yeah, we're, we're awesome. Let's ship this. And this is the problem with a lot of code, right? Like, obviously, this is a contrived example. It's a, it's a code example, right? But how many people have run into this where you make a change and like literally nothing fails, right? You comment out a line. You make a. I, I did this recently where I had a typo. It was an obvious typo, and I was like, ah, F it, Control S. And I had guard running, and nothing failed. And I was like, that's awesome, right? <laughs> um, unfortunately, this is how a lot of our legacy code is, right? It's just not test it. Even though, like, if we look at, let's get out of here for a second. If we look at our coverage, dude. On the entire project, we're 74% covered. Like, how awesome is that? On this particular class, we're 67% covered. Oh, no, actually, we're 100% covered now with all the changes. <laughs> like, dude, just drop the elbow, call it good, right? So this sucks. I can't change, I literally can't change anything in here with any degree of certainty. That's terrible, right? All kidding aside, if you're doing this for a living and you do that, oh. You still have the indentation. Oh, thank you. On comment 47. There you go. Yeah. So if you're doing this for a living and you do something like this, that should really upset you. So I know it upsets me um, in all seriousness. So. So this test is terrible. So let's just get rid of it, right? Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to use we're going to use Katrina Owen's approvals gem to create some test output that we can then check whether or not we've changed any output. And this is what Golden Master testing is all about. So basically, what we're going to do is we are going to um, require the approvals gem. Um, I'm not even sure where she has that require. There we go. So we're going to require the approvals gem. Right up, yeah. And then we can do something like <coughs> this. And actually, we can't get. This is one of the problems with legacy code is that technically we can't even get to this item from the Gilded Rose class because it's just an instance variable, which is super awesome. So we have to kind of pry in there and grab it. So by doing this and Sorry, I don't use RSpec, but the RSpec. What do you use? I use Minitest. Okay, then. Um, because it's the Rails way. Uh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I actually, I used to be an RSpec -y person, and then um, on the project that I'm on right now, we decided to go with Minitest. And for those of you that don't use Minitest, I'm actually a huge fan of it. It's pretty cool. RSpec does give you a lot of syntactic sugar. Um, which is nice, but the fact that Minitest is quote unquote just Ruby is actually really cool and taught me a lot about unit testing effectively. You know, instead of being wrapped around the axle on my R specness. Um, so, so we can do something like this and we're going to get a failure. So what's happening here is the verify method comes from our the approvals gem. And what it's doing is it is writing out as a string whatever you pass it. And then it's putting that string into a text file in your fixtures. And then what you do 
and this is why it's known as either the golden master or guru checks the output, is that you need a guru, in this case that's me, so like, awesome. Um, you need a guru to verify the output. So what we're going to do, I think it's approvals verify. Yeah. Um, so I run the approvals verify command. So the approvals gem gives this to me. Um, and we're going to verify all of the unverified output. So what this is doing is it's basically showing me what is in the verifies the thing approved.txt file would be. And I can read through this, inspect output, and say like, yeah, that's what I would expect would happen if I instantiate the thing and get an item and call inspect on it. Right? So I can say, yeah, let's approve that. Now if I run rspec again, I'm going to fail. Does anybody know why I might be failing? Yeah, exactly. So your object IDs are going to be different from run the run. So the approvals gem is pretty cool because it makes this golden master testing super cheap, but you do have to do a little bit of coercion. So what we're going to wind up doing, and I'm just going to take this guy right now. And I'll just take the whole thing. What we're going to wind up doing is we are going to coerce our item into a string. So instead of doing just a raw inspect, because this is going to give us this problem where this ID and this ID are different, we're going to ignore the item IDs because we don't care about that. What we really care about are these three attributes, name, sell in, and quantity. We want to ensure that these never change. Right? So we're going to coerce this thing into a string. And I believe this is what I need to do. I'll just approve that for now. I'll run my R spec again. It's going to fail. I'll approve it. And this time, if you see, it's giving me something a little bit more useful. Right? So this is what is the new output. And this is my string. These are all six items that are instantiated here in the initialize. So when I start this thing up, when I, start, when I initialize the gilded rows, I get the six items that are part of my awesome sauce initialize method. And I want to ensure that that awesome sauce initialize method doesn't change. So now I can say yes. I can rerun my spec, and it passes. And this is cool. So I can run that as many times as I like, and I'm always going to pass. And if I did something awesome, like got rid of that, I will fail. So yay. So whoa. And I'm passing again. So let's rerun our, our test coverage. Um, so I'm, for those of you that, that this might be a little bit hand wavy, um, what I'm looking at here is the output from a gem called SimpleCov, which is super useful and awesome. If you use Code Climate at work, uh, Code Climate, I believe, is built on top of SimpleCov along with Flog. Um, you can use both of those things on the, on the command line just for free because they're open source and they're awesome. Um, so if we look, we can see that basically nothing in the Gilded Rose file is covered other than the initialized method at this point, right? So our goal is to be able to cover as many of these lines with some kind of test as, po uh, as quickly as possible. So what we're going to do is we are going to... Uh, We're going to update the quality, and we'll run our spec. 
and this is going to throw a failure. And this is where golden master testing like really falls apart is that every single time you have a change in your code, you have to go through this whole approval process. So for something as simple as the Gilded Rose class and an item class, this isn't that big a deal. But you can imagine how quickly this breaks down if you're working with like real code with real attributes, right? And if you need a real expert in order to verify that those changes are really correct. So you don't want to be using golden master testing in your day-to-day -day code. You really want to only do it when you're trying to guarantee that you haven't changed anything. That way you can be the guru. You know that you shouldn't be changing anything. You're doing the refactoring, right? So as long as nothing changes, you're golden. That pun was not intended. <laughs> um, so what we're looking at here is that, um, that when I ran the update, we are decrementing quali uh, quantities and qualities, sell-in dates and whatnot. And by doing so, we're going to start exercising some of these code paths. So you can see lines 35, 43, 46. These guys are now getting tested. Something is running through this code when I hit update quality. So the trick is, how do we do this enough times so that we actually start to exercise all these code paths? And don't worry, we can do a loop for that. So I'm going to spare you guys the embarrassment of me typing. Whoop. Yeah. All right. So we won't skip right to the end. Let's do this five times. So the reason that this works this way, and this won't work for every single use of the approvals gem or golden master testing, is that the update quality method is an incrementer. So every time the update quality method runs, we're doing things to our quality and our sell-in date. Um, actually, I think just our quality. So we're doing things to the quality by either incrementing it or decrementing it. So depending on what type of, of item you are, your quality will either go down over time or it'll go up. So by running, by running the update quality, you're mutating your, your data, right? Um, so because we can do that, or because that, this method works that way, we can just run the update quality so many, oh, so many times. In this case, we'll try it five times. So we run our spec, and this is going to fail. So it's telling us that each of our generated specs after zero, I don't know, including zero, um, failed, right? So, and the reason for that is, again, because we just haven't verified all the outputs. So we'll just go ahead and verify it all on mass because we don't really care. We haven't changed anything. We're just going to say that that's good enough. So if we rerun our test coverage or recheck our test coverage, we can see that we've exercised more aspects of the code, right? We're touching something in here that's turning that line from red to green. We'll run it 10 times. We'll approve some more of this output because we're super guru-like, and that's what we do. And now we're at almost 92% covered. We've got a couple more that aren't being exercised. Notice I really don't give a crap about what the code is doing at this point. Like, doesn't matter. We run it 20 times, and I know that 20 is the, the one that wins because Randy Coleman told me so. 
and we approve everything. And now we've covered all of the code paths. And we can mutate some stuff. Hopefully that fails. Woot! Yay! So at this point, I can start refactoring this code, which is not what I'm going to do because this, this talk is not about refactoring. This talk is about getting your legacy code under unit test or under, under, under test. Um, but you can see how code coverage in and of itself is a semi-useful metric. Just because you have 73% code coverage doesn't actually mean you should have 73% confidence that your tests are going to save you. Right? It's really just a matter of whether or not you're exercising these code paths. And even there, you shouldn't have 100% confidence because if you have ternaries or any kind of embedded weirdness, um, metaprogramming is another super awesome thing. You can exer exercise that code path once, but there might be n number of ways to exercise that code path, um, which is going to hurt you. Um, so your test, per your code coverage percentage gives you some sense of how well your unit tests are going to save your bacon. But really, if you want it to be 100% certain, and 100% is probably a loaded, a loaded phrase, if you want it to be more certain, you could do mutation analysis on top of this. Um, unfortunately, I don't really know of a good gem in the Ruby community that does mutation analysis really well. If anybody does know that, I would love to hear it. Um, I think the concept of mutation analysis is super awesome, and obviously you can do it manually, but that's kind of slow. Um, but for those of you that aren't aware, mutation analysis is basically having your code do some, having something automated that just changes, you know, a bit. So a not equal to an equal to, or an equality, um, and then reruns your tests. And if your test doesn't fail, um, then that's, oh, wait a minute, I didn't save. If your test doesn't fail, then that was a mutant that got through your test coverage and basically killed you. So you release mutants onto your code. If your unit tests don't kill the mutants, then those mutants eat you, basically. That's how it was described to me. Um, and I think mutation analysis might be the cat's pajamas. I just really wish that I could do it for reals in my day job. Um, so anyway, so now that we have um, golden master testing around this code, we can start changing the code. And as long as our specs don't change, that means our, as long as our specs don't fail, that means that our output, these attributes, name, cell, and quality, haven't changed. So we can be fairly sure that we're not introducing any regressions that would affect the actual uh, qualities or properties of our application for this class, right? So let's go back to this. Um, so one of the things that I've learned in the last couple of years is that reading is greater than Googling. Uh, these are a couple of books that I have read. Um, I haven't read The Refactoring by Martin Fowler, although I hear it's amazing. But working effectively with legacy code and then refactoring the Ruby edition um, are both really, really good books. Um, unfortunately, neither one of these necessarily touches on the approach of golden master testing. A lot of times they call it um, characteristic testing, I believe. Um, but the characteristic testing is done manually. And that's one of the problems that I have with this, is that getting some of these characteristic tests in place can be really, really costly. So think of a class that might be you know, a couple hundred lines long, or a method that's 150 lines long, and might take, I don't know, a half dozen to a dozen parameters. Any, any one of those could, could contain n number of possible inputs. right? So. Uh, that Code Whisperer's blog about integration testing uh, being a scam, he basically runs through the math on those permutations. 
And very quickly, you can see how something like that can turn into hundreds of thousands of tests in order to get really good coverage. So if you're actually writing these tests by hand, that's terrible. And you're really not going to get a huge, uh, a great coverage. So a few questions that I have, and these are honest questions. I really don't know the answer to these questions because this is something that I've been grappling with for a little while, but something I've been seriously thinking about for probably about a month now since the last Rails uh, RubyConf meeting. So one, is Golden Master testing just a terrible idea? One of the things that was kind of interesting to me is while I was researching this talk, there is literally not a Wikipedia article for Golden Master testing. It doesn't exist on Wikipedia. And to me, that means like it's not a thing, right? Um, there are a handful of blogs out there where people talk about effectively working with code by using Golden Master or Guru Checks the out Output Testing, but very, very few. And I know when, when Ryan Davis started working on my team, he and I kind of argued about this a lot, where we're in, this we're in this terrible spot with our code where we don't have effective unit test coverage, but where do you go from there, right? So I believe that Golden Master testing is actually a valid technique if used appropriately, but I don't know. So I've yet to see this actually work out to completion on a project. It's just something that I've been grappling with and believe that it's a, it's a useful tool. And the second question is, are there ways to do this cheaper? So most of the unit tests you're going to be writing on legacy code probably, probably fall into the classification of characteristic tests or golden master tests. You wouldn't call them that. You would call them unit tests. But the reality is, is if you wrote the unit test without actually understanding the code, or being able to break apart its dependencies, you probably didn't understand the code under test. And when that test fails, you're probably not going to understand how to fix that test, right? Which is really no different than reading the output and verifying a new, a new set of golden masters, right? It just happens to be that the mechanism for doing so is slightly different. So one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot and uh, where I kind of started going down this rabbit hole was when I when I rewatched Randy Coleman's talk uh, from last year's RailsConf, I looked at his use of the approvals gem, and it kind of dawned on me that you could use this type of approach to basically cheapen the cost on getting that kind of crappy unit test coverage that you need to have. You need to have some form of unit test coverage in order to actually be able to make changes. But the trick is, how do you make it, how do you get that unit test coverage faster? And one of the things that I've been playing with is, can we use the approvals gem and other techniques in order to get the, the test coverage that we need in order to make the changes to be able to write actual unit tests? So here are a couple of part, parting thoughts. One thing, and I've talked to a couple of people about this particular topic, and people usually have one of two approaches. They either basically say, golden, mas golden master testing is for fools. Don't ever do that. Or they say, golden master testing sounds like the silver bullet that I need, and I want to do that for everything all the time. I would assert that that's probably false for both statements. Right? I believe that golden master testing is actually a useful technique if used appropriately. However, I believe that that appropriateness is limited to the scope of the refactor that you're in at the moment. So when I pitched this to Ryan Davis, uh, when I was uh, formulating this talk for Test RB last month, I basically said that I believe that golden master tests are useful, and he said false. And I said, hold on. I believe that golden master tests are useful for the time that you're doing a refactor, and then immediately after that, burn that stuff to the ground, <laughs> right? And he said, OK, I can get behind that. And I believe that that's probably a good, a good guideline. You can use this, but that's why I call this talk golden thorns. It is going to be very, very easy for you to hurt yourself with this stuff. Don't look at it as a silver bullet, because this is not a silver bullet. It's just a useful tool to be able to put a cast around your code so you can fix the code and write really good unit tests against good code. And that gets me to my second point, is that once you actually have the cast around your code, Boy Scout the F out of your code. The problem that I have right now with the Boy Scout rule, which is something that Ryan, uh, Michael Feathers brings up in his legacy code book, is that the way I've seen it. What is the Boy Scout rule? 
The Boy Scout rule. Thank you. Um, the Boy Scout rule is that you basically always leave your campground or whatever your code is in a slightly better state than when you found it, right? And that sounds really good in practice, but what I've found in, in reality is that your code, your code quality basically moves at a, like improves at a snail's pace, right? So what'll happen is you have some really nasty methods that are hanging out and you'll wrap those up in some fairly easy to, to reach for unit tests. And then you're gonna go ahead and maybe fix up a couple of those methods. But eventually what's gonna happen is that class is gonna have most of the low hanging fruit taken care of. You've boy scouted that class pretty well. So all of the, all the pretty easy stuff is, is pretty well addressed, right? But then you're gonna have things like embedded dependencies or embedded classes. And that gets a little bit trickier because how do you wrap that up? How do you wrap that class up effectively so that you can actually pull out the dependencies? And obviously you can do it incrementally, but from what I've seen, almost nobody really wants to make that leap, right? If I can maintain the scope of my PR to a single method, your team's gonna, gonna do that, right? They don't want to break off an entire class, especially if that class is heinous and if that class has a lot of dependencies throughout your code, right? So how do we get out of this quagmire? And that's one of the reasons that I started thinking about this is we need to be able to get greater and greater scopes of coverage around our, around our classes so that we can get more aggressive, right? And doing them incrementally is definitely one approach, and I believe that that's a correct approach. But for certain classes, I believe using golden master testing would give you greater latitude to, maybe be, able to, to be able to make more aggressive changes safely. And again, I don't know that to be true. We're trying it right now, and we're, having, we're learning as we go. But let me know if you try this. Feel free to tweet at me. Uh, my handle, again, is paulbaker3. And thank you. You're awesome. <laughs> so a couple of thanks. Um, one huge thanks to Randy Coleman, who is a friend of mine and a mentor and an awesome dude all around. He works for a company called Zeal. Um, they're located in Southern Oregon. Uh, they are just awesome people, and Randy's just an amazing developer. Um, feel free to take a look at uh, his talks and um, his blog. Uh, another big thanks uh, to Lauren Voswinkel. This, yay, Lauren, who's sitting right there. Um, Lauren and I were talking at the end of last month's uh, PDXRB, and I was basically musing about working with legacy code and how terrible it is. And Lauren's comment was, Golden Master. Like, Golden Master is your friend. And I was like, that's interesting, because I've definitely heard of that concept, but I've never really given it any kind of due. But when someone as smart as Lauren says something like that, I said, OK, there might be something to it. And that's when I, that led me down this route of inquiry. And here are some of the other uh, things that I looked at. Jim Wyrick's uh, Gilded Rose Cotto, which is really cool. Um, Sandy Metz's uh, coverage of that. Working effectively with legacy code, which I, which I believe should be required reading for anybody that, anybody that works in production code. And then a bunch of other blog posts. And then finally, a, a special thanks to Ryan Davis, Steamed Books, and the rest of my Capture dev team for letting me experiment on them and uh, work through these concepts. So thanks a lot. I appreciate you guys being an awesome audience. <laughs>